Let us please start. Um, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, dear colleagues, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zones. I would like to, to really give you a warm welcome to the One Health briefing on avian influenza, uh, which we organized today out of Geneva. My name is Dominique Burgeon, and I am the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I will be very pleased to moderate today's session. FAO, WHO, and OA have been supporting members on pandemic prevention and preparedness for zoonotic influenza. WHO, Influenza Program, shares information on influenza surveillance, conducts risk assessment, and guides the WHO biannual uh, influenza vaccine composition meetings, complemented by information provided by OFLU, the joint OA, FAO Scientific Network on Animal Influenza Network of Expertise on Animal Influenzas. These global efforts have created improved detection and response capacities in many countries over the years. Considering the alarming spread of HPAI and the evolution of avian influenza in the wild birds and mammals, as well as the pressing needs to further strengthen cross-sectoral collaboration, we have decided with our colleagues from the Quadripartite uh, to dedicate one special episode of the One Health Dialogue series to zoom in, in on the avian influenza situation, to inform partners in part permanent mission in Geneva of the latest scientific findings and knowledge to support development and implementation of disease prevention and control strategies and policies, as well as FAO's and partners' contribution to global efforts towards reducing pandemic risk. Today, we are really pleased, and I see that we are joined also by uh, Tanawat Tiensin, uh, the Assistant Director General, Director of the FAO Animal Health and, and Production Division. So, a warm welcome. Uh, Tanawat, we are very pleased to have with us a number of distinguished speakers uh, from FAO, uh, WHO, OHA, and UNEP, uh, which, as you know, is known as the Quadripartite, will brief us on the uh, collaborative uh, efforts. Welcome also, Maria. Uh, I see that you just joined. Uh, so, without further delay, let's start with uh, Madur uh, Dingra the senior animal health officer who is also leading animal health prevention preparedness and rapid response cluster at FAO. And today, Madur will provide us with an overview of FAO contributions to global efforts on uh, avian influenza. Madur, uh, over to you uh, for uh, your presentation. Please try to remain uh, within the allocated time as we have uh, quite a few speakers today. Please. Thank you, Dominique. Um, let's move to the next slide, please, in the interest of time. And uh, I just want to highlight that our work on uh, preventing and controlling avian influenza is within the One Health program in FAO, which seeks uh, transformation to sustainable agri-food systems through One Health implementation. And there's quite this is quite a wide portfolio of work, which involves um, you know, global animal disease control and eradication programs, improving health system capacities uh, to prepare and respond at all levels, uh, building capacities through the support provided by the network of reference centers, uh, OFLU and other networks that operate within this area, improving the accessibility and quality of vaccines, workforce development, and strengthening One Health implementation for pandemic prevention and AMR prevention. Next slide, please. And all this work we do in collaboration with our, with our different partners and uh, in collaboration with different divisions within FAO. Uh, so one of the main things that FAO does is provide global policy support. And in response to this massive spread of avian influenza, uh, FAO organized a global consultation in May last year and several regional consultations. Um, 
FAO has supported disease intelligence, uh, and we do a daily disease monitoring based on which we provide, you know, weekly animal health threats update, a global avian influenza situation update. Uh, we collaborate on early warning and response with our partners, FAO, uh, WHO, uh, WOA, the Global Early Warning and Response System, GLUES. And we're also uh, supporting the mapping of hotspots of domestic wild bird interfaces. Uh, and then we've developed the prototype of an avian influenza forecasting tool. And we've provided quite a lot of uh, technical guidance and risk assessment to all these emerging events. Next slide, please. Uh, just as an example, I want to highlight that FAO has animal health and one health teams present in more than 50 countries globally. And you can see this on the map there. Uh, FAO has country offices in, in uh, 130 countries. And through that, we've really supported a lot of capacity development. And you can see some of the numbers here. Uh, in addition to that, we've supported uh, disease outbreak response uh, uh, support, and that involves, you know, provision of laboratory reagents through a stockpile that we maintain at the Cyberstoff lab in Vienna. Uh, there's a lot of emergency response mission support provided, uh, and a lot of these responses are One Health, and an example of that is the recent uh, cases of um, H5 that were detected in, in Cambodia. So collaborating with pu public health uh, authorities on outbreak response and on surveillance as well. Next, please. So these are some numbers. Um, so you can see from 2017 to 20. Uh, 23, we have supported more than 280 outbreak responses, and these have been spread across different countries. Not all of them have been, you know, directly avian influenza, but diseases in poultry value chains as well. Um, next, please. Now, recognizing that that prevention and control needs to start at source. Um, uh, lately, FAO has shifted its approach from a disease by disease approach to a more system strengthening approach. And this is being done through the implementation of a, the progressive management pathway for terrestrial animal biosecurity. And this is a bottom up approach with co created solutions for biosecurity management uh, developed jointly between public and private stakeholders with enabling policies and legislations identified. And this pathway is now being implemented in almost 20 countries around the world. Uh, it's not always called PMP tab, as you see it here. Uh, different countries call it different names, but it's really a bottom up approach. And this is supported by a global community of practice for experience sharing, uh, which, is, uh, which has more than 500 members. Um, next slide, please. Uh, now, when emergencies occur, it's it's a very tough job to train large people quickly on, on what might be an evolving, emerging risk. So during COVID, we, find it, uh, very, we found it very difficult to do capacity development because we couldn't go onto the field. So FAO established a network of virtual learning centers, and we had these seven virtual learning centers in different sub-regions and regions. And since this avian influenza epidemic broke out, you know, we have trained more than 3,100 people in different courses uh, related to HPI and HPI vaccination uh, in, in multiple languages. Um, we've also delivered uh, the avian influenza uh, matching for poultry vaccines webinars. Uh, this is a collaborative project between FAO and BOA. Uh, of flu network, because a lot of countries are now open to vaccination, but good vaccination requires good knowledge. And it, this, uh, you, with the use of the VLCs, it's a good way to train large a number of people across geographies uh, at, at a limited cost. Next slide, please. Now, with WOA, we have developed the uh, Global Control Strategy for the Prevention and Control of High Pathogenic Avian Influenza. This 
is a strategy that has been revised. It was last updated in 2008. And as you can see from the three main objectives, prevent, protect, and transform. You know, these are the goals that really seek to uh, protect humans, uh, poultry, other domestic animals, wildlife, and also to align and promote sustainable livestock sector transformation within agri-food systems. And the next step would be to develop national action plans aligned to this. Next slide, please. Uh, you will probably hear more about OFLU. FAO collaborates a lot with uh, other global partners. And as Dominic mentioned, OFLU is the joint scientific network of expertise. And it provides its contribution to pandemic preparedness uh, every year, twice a year, to the WHO's vaccine composition meeting. The most recent one has just concluded in, in Australia. Uh, we organize periodic calls on information sharing between FAO, WHO, GOA, and OFLU to share information on evolving situation of avian influenza. Uh, FAO has collaborated with the Convention on um, Migratory Species, CMS, Ramsar, UNESCO, on delivering these webinars to protect wildlife in UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Because when these massive mortalities started happening, uh, people didn't know how to manage them. And it wasn't easy to, to support this response. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in response to the recent events happening in cattle in the Americas, FAO has been monitoring the situation and we've rapidly published the Empress Watch, which summarizes the latest situation and provides guidance. Uh, we've worked uh, with WHO and WOA on providing joint assessments uh, in April and August. Uh, the FAO's Food Safety Division has produced food safety recommendations, and we'll be soon publishing the surveillance guidelines for avian influenza and cattle. And we will soon be organizing a quadripartite consultation for to develop a technical and operational framework for readiness and preparedness. Next slide, please. Now, all of you have heard about the Pandemic Fund, and this is, I think, an opportunity for all of us to work together and for FAO to work together at country level on these really priority areas for controlling not only avian influenza, but any other pandemic risk that might arise. And as you can see, collaborative surveillance, laboratory strengthening, uh, workforce development are key areas of this. Um, FAO is the implementing entity in 11 country proposals and one regional proposal uh, in the first round and I'm sure the second round will be out soon. And I think this is an opportunity for us to really enhance these areas of work for pandemic preparedness and prevention. It's very easy to say this and difficult to implement. <laughs> so we need to work together. Next, please. Now, I just want to highlight that, you know, challenges remain. And, and we all know these challenges, you know, different types of production systems, continuous emergence of uh, new viruses, risk of mammalian adaptation, and lack of LPAI monitoring. Uh, and I think it's really important that, that we don't uh, see these only as challenges and really work together under the framework that the four organizations have, uh, the one had joint plan of action, uh, but also involve other partners and stakeholders in really dealing with this big challenge that is facing us. Um, with that, I hand it back to you, Dominic. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Madhur, for brushing such a, a comprehensive picture in such a short uh, time, indeed highlighting the impact of avian influenza, uh, on various sectors and highlighting the, the, the importance of, uh, of the One Health approach to tackle this threat at the human, animal and environment uh, interface. And of course, thanks for especially highlighting in the context of today's meeting the, the importance of, uh, of multi-agency uh, collaboration and the, all, most of the activities which you described indeed connect us to the, to the colleagues uh, who are in the virtual room uh, today with us. So, Thank you so much, uh, Madhur, for this, pre this presentation. 
And now uh, I would like to, to give the floor to Maria Van Kerkhove, who is the director at Interim of uh, Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention Department at WHO, and our team uh, will present on uh, WHO's work on avian influenza and the collaboration with the other agencies of the of the quadripartite. So Maria, Maria, uh, great to see you and uh, over to you. Great to see you as well. And thank you so much for inviting us to this. Thank you so much for the strong collaboration across FAO, OHA, UNEP um, in this really critical area. I've actually asked Wen Jing Zhang, Dr. Wen Jing Zhang, who's the lead of the Global Influenza Program to give our presentation, but just wanted to highlight a couple of things very briefly before I pass the floor to her. One is partnership. Uh, and collaboration. We clearly have very strong collaboration at an international level, at a global level. We see this strength trickle down into regions, into countries, and at local level, but that's where we want to see that even stronger, to tackle threats like avian influenza H5N1. Um, we've just had a, an excellent presentation from FAO highlighting all of the different challenges that we see. We see similar ones as well, and I think not only do we see how we can address those challenges, but the added value that each organization provides in support for these combined threats that we face. We have different organizations, we have different mandates, we have different objectives, but we, we collectively can see that the work coming together can address these threats and we can be stronger for it. So thank you very much for continuing to work with us um, so diligently. Um, and I'll pass the floor to Dr. Wen Jing Zhang, the head of our Global Influenza Program to give our presentation. Wen Jing, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I have some slides, so I'll share my screen or... Okay, I think I can share my screen, right? Um... Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. you may want to present it in slideshow mode. Okay, is that all right, or I need to? I think you need to click. Uh, yeah, make it full screen, 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 Wenjing, if you can. Yeah, full screen. Yeah. Uh, how to? Down at the bottom, there should be a button there. Um, bottom right hand side should be a bottom to make it full screen. Yes, you were close. <laughs> oh, goodness, no. Um, actually, I also sent a slide to you just a couple of minutes ago. If you could run from your end, that's also fine. Can you, uh, show you? Can you do that? Sorry, I haven't received the... the I can do it for you if you... I've sent a request to share screens. If you can stop sharing your screen, Wen Jing, then I can do it from... Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. Please go ahead, Wenji. Okay, so as a WHO being as a, the, the, the public health a leading agency in the UN, our focus is really looking at the public health, public health, the human in humans, every influenza in humans, but also we've been working, looking into the human animal interface in collaboration with our partners uh, presented here. Um, this slide actually I only prepared for an update, so I didn't include a comprehensive WHO strategy towards any influenza. But let's move on. Next slide, Maria. So for human infection with zoonotic influenza virus, it really started long, long ago. And this chart shows more than 3,000 uh, actually human infections here. A couple of points here is that there are different colors, and different color stands for different uh, type and subtype of, uh, of avian influenza and also swine influenza virus as well, because they are also zoonotic influenza viruses that have public health uh, significance. In the middle part, there's, there's a certain blue bars there. Actually, it is H7 and 9. So a good reminder to us, being doing the public health is not just H5N1, but we also need to take into many you know, other subtypes of zoonotic avian flu. Next slide, please. So if we zoom in a little bit more since 2020, and this again is a, is a chart showing the human infection, more than 320 uh, human infections, the point I would like to make here is that even during COVID-19 pandemic, 
the human infection of zoonotic influenza didn't stop. Next slide, please. So let's zoom in even further for the recent period. This is from October 2023. And a couple message we can see from here is first is that the human infection of avian influenza or zoonotic influenza is really global. The second point is that those human infections so far is really associated with the, the outbreaks in animals, as we can see from, 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 from the map here. And the third is the, all those different types and different subtypes of any influenza infection reported globally. Next slide, please. So the question really is that, so what's, what's upcoming? What's next for us? Because we need to prepare. This slide, I believe some of you may already see repeatedly, and it tells us more. Is, is this uh, H5N1 in particular, this subtype of influenza virus is constantly uh, expanding since 2022. From, from the left side is a geographical spread, and from the left side is into the different species, and more we're worrisome is into more mammalian species. And of course, the recent, the most recent species affected is, is their dairy cattle. Next slide, please. So what is the approach to this phenomenon? And it's not new actually seen for any influenza. And that is a, is a global system. And uh, it's also mentioned also by Mother Hu and also Dominic at the very beginning. So WHO systematic approach to influenza in the past more than 70 years. This is a GISRIS, G-I-S-I-S. Based on this network, we've been delivering every year. A lot of work. Next slide. So according uh, among all those deliverables, one is really to looking at the virus evolution, but more on the public health perspective, for example, whether the changes observed is consistent, because this might mean a signal of a cluster of the viruses emerged, which might trigger the next pandemic. Whether the receptor binding is changing, which means this virus could potentially increase the, the transmission in people. And more very importantly about the candidate vaccine viruses, which are mentioned by both Dominic and Madhu, is really looking at the candidate vaccine viruses that need to be used for human vaccine development and production. Next slide, please. So Madhu also mentioned about the vaccine composition meeting. We just finished the last week or two weeks ago in Australia. In this consultation, what, what, uh, half of the, uh, of the work is on seasonal vaccine composition uptake, and another half is to look at the zoonotic candidate vaccine uptake. So in addition to H5, but even for H5, this consultation or WHO's network looking into different clades like 2321A, 2321C, 2344B, this is a clade actually causing uh, outbreak in US at the moment, but also like low pathogenic AV influenza H5N1, which caused a human infection in Mexico. We also look at H5, H9N2, H10N3, both, both of the viruses cause the infection. And let's never forget the influenza in swine. So this is a good example. Again, we look into the candidate vaccine viruses. Um, although the, the current 2344B, the virus causing outbreak in US, the available candidate vaccine virus can cover very well the current circulating viruses. But if we look at the virus causing human infection in Southeast Asia, there is a need of development of a new CBEs. And this is one of the outcomes from the, uh, the, the vaccine composition consultation two weeks ago. Next slide, please. So another example of the update here is WHO. We're also looking at uh, the, 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 the H5 vaccine use because some countries already started using the vaccines in targeted groups. And also many other countries are looking at advancing the pre pandemic vaccine preparedness. WHO in 2208, we 
had, uh, had a guidance for countries on the options for use of HIV vaccines. So, so we had a consultation uh, weeks ago, and at the moment, we're updating these uh, guide guidelines. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, next slide, Maria. Oh, that's all. I guess I missed one slide there. I just want to make a, a, a point here is about the WHO's work. WHO's work cover, covered many areas from the surveillance, risk assessment, community engagement to mitigate of the impact of an emergency of that. In this forum, I just want to highlight the long-term collaboration with uh, with uh, with WHO and with FAO with OFLU on the uh, every influenza side. Every influenza side, long before actually uh, two two thousand and nine. Or the, 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 the outbreak uh, situation here is that they've been continuously engagement with our flu system, like a joint statement in 2011-2013, in, in the H7 and 9 situation, etc. And also at the moment, also mentioned by Madhubur, we are developing, uh, we are looking into the update of the joint operational platform or joint uh, operational format in the new situation now. Um, and we'll look, continue looking into the risk in the human animal interface as, as it evolves. So that's all from my side. Um, I don't Maria, if you want to add anything, otherwise it's done from my side. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Just to highlight for us at WHO working in partnership with you, we feel that what the situation with avian influenza with H5N1 or even H7N9 that Wen Jing said is, is testing our systems, testing the systems that have been in place and the readiness work that we are doing. The one slide that she didn't have, sorry, Wen Jing, that, that, that one didn't show up. The comprehensive work across the space in terms of readiness is good preparedness for the future. We get the question all the time, will this virus be the next pandemic one? And of course we don't know. But we feel that the work that we are doing in demonstrating the systems, testing these systems, learning from 2009 H1N1 pandemic, learning from COVID, learning from all of these different outbreaks is getting us ready for the future. So it's it's well worth the investment and it's well worth the time. So whether it's now or whether it's in the future, um, the work that we're doing in testing these systems will, will be beneficial for, for everyone. So back to you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Wenjing and, uh, and Maria, for, for this comprehensive presentation, for even touching on the on the question everybody wants to ask. But but indeed, as you say, I mean, the more we prepare, the more uh, the more we will be ready to respond to any form of uh, of new outbreak. So thank you so much uh, for that, Maria and Wenjing. And now let me uh, move to our next speaker, uh, Gunalan Pavad, who is. Uh, scientific coordinator from the science department at OHA and will present on the role of OHA supporting members and the specific activities of the OFLU network, uh, which will enable us to understand the evolution of influenza viruses in animal species and the risk for human and animal production system worldwide. So Gunaran, uh, the floor is yours for about five minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, uh, for inviting OHA for this uh, One Health briefing on avian influenza. So one of the main mission of OHA is to ensure transparency in the global animal disease situation, including hypothogenicity, avian influenza, and zoonotic animal influenza. So in this mission, I'm going to highlight in my presentation about the global situation on HPI and what is the impact globally and what all the global activities OHA is involved in collaboration with other international organizations for its prevention and control. Next slide, please. So here, as you might know, the world has been affected by avian influenza outbreaks for several decades now. It's been happening for several years, and but in the recent years, the intensity and the spread of outbreaks is increased multifolds in both domestic and wildlife populations in the recent years. So this slide, you can see the global distribution of 
HPI in poultry. You can see almost all the regions are affected. Mainly, you can see in the last year in October 2023 to September 2024, the season. If you consider the season of influenza, the last season, which is coming to an end now, you can see the outbreak situation in poultry. We can see more and more outbreaks in happening still in Europe and Americas and, and also the other regions. We can see the outbreak and we have recently have the recurrence in o Oceania that is in Australia also which were absent for some years and you can see the outbreaks number of outbreaks happening mainly in Americas 315 and Europe comes then we also have the other regions experiencing outbreaks with regard to the impact you can see the number of poultry killed and disposed of in millions where we can see the Americas standing the fall compared to the other regions next slide please Yes, not only in poultry, but we also have the non-poultry, including wild birds. And as mentioned before, we have the virus has increased its species uh, infection rate to other species like mammals. We can see which in this slide cover shows the distribution of non-poultry, including wild birds and mammals. So you can see almost all the regions are also showing the occurrence here for the last season. Mainly you can see the virus has spread to the Americas and now to the South Americas and also it has reached to the Antarctic region where we found the infections spread to in the January 2024 where it poses a major threat to the biodiversity and wildlife conservation. And you can see the number of outbreaks in Europe, 740, and, and followed by the Americas, 347. And also, as we told, there is a major threat to the wildlife conservation, the number of dead wild birds in all the regions you can see in Americas, Asia, and Europe, we can see a lot of mortality of wild birds and also other conservation biodiversity effects. Next slide, please. So one of the main mission of OHA is to provide, update its members with what is happening on the avian influenza. So where we provide a global alert, we're providing OHA statements whenever some emerging uh, threats has been there. So when with regard to the situation, with regard to the wildlife, we provided an OHA statement summarizing the situation and providing guidelines and members with our wildlife working group on wildlife, which provides statements and guidelines on how to handle the wild bird situation and what are all the measures to be adopted in these situations. Next slide, please. So this slide, as you can see previously, we used to have subtypes, which is caused by the avian influenza. But now, as you can see, the clade 2344B is the major clade, which has been circulating very widely, where you can see 87 percentage in poultry, it is circulating, and also in the non-poultry birds, including wild birds, we have 84 percentage of the clade H5N1. But also, we also encountering other subtypes uh, in other regions also. Next slide, please. So here you can see, comparing to the season from 2022-23 to with the season that is currently coming to an end 2023-24. to 24. So you can see the number of countries, although it has marginally decreased in this current year, but still we see the number of countries or territories reporting HPI to OHA still maintains posing a constant threat by the avian influenza. Next slide, please. So this slide just summarizes the because previously, even FUNSA were more concentrated to poultry and wild birds, but now the impact has also on, gone to the biodiversity where we have seen mass mortality events. More than 51,000 mammals died in South America in the last season. And not only the number of countries reporting mammals has increased, but also the species of affecting in the mammals. As uh, Also, you can see here, companion animals, formed fur-bearing animals, marine mammals, other domestic mammals, terrestrial wild animals are also affected. Through our AFLU network, we have issued statements explaining what is happening globally. Next slide, please. So currently, very recently, we can see the detection of HPI in cattle in United States of America in March 2024, and also in additionally some human cases associated with these cases. So you can see now that 12 countries are since reporting this here, the increase in the number of cases domestic in the domestic and wild mammals. 
So the next slide, please. Here, based on this, as I told you before, OHAS uh, provided a statement about summarizing the situation in cattle in collaboration with the USDA authorities. So as you can see here, the start date in there with an eight breaks, and now in the week running to 27, we have more than 202 outbreaks in 14 states happening in HPI uh, infections in cattle. So by this, OHA provided statements how the members should enhance surveillance considering differential diagnosis and also to include surveillance in other species, including cattle. Next slide, please. So to summarize the global situation, HPI has led to the death and mass slaughter of more than 525 million birds between 2005 and 24. And the current year, the last season, we have 57 million birds killed. And in the, also we have, can see the number of countries reporting constantly is there. So it was 84 countries and now reaching 88 countries. In the current season, we have 71 countries still reporting in 2024. So this is a significant impact we can see also threat to the biodiversity involving wild wet populations. And now the new situation, we need to handle the HPI situation in cattle industry. Next slide, please. So considering all the impact, the dynamic infection, OHA hosted the HPI Animal Health Forum in the May 2023 general session. This provided an opportunity for all the sub members and the subject matter experts to have an open discussion, what are the best practices and measures and what methods needs to be done to tackle avian influenza. We had a technical item which presented the strategic challenges in the global control of HPI and what all the policy to action that can be done in the future years. This was concluded by a resolution which provided some 19 recommendations, uh, what all the things to be followed in the future years. Next slide, please. So we are currently, we are trying to implement the resolution adopted in the May 2023 general session. So we can see here through our smart indicators, at least 55 percentage of already we've been pursuing on these recommendations. So the recommendations is mainly on improving surveillances, improving tools, prevention and control, and to ensure the safe international trade is being facilitated by implementation of the OHA international standards. And there is global and regional coordination on avian influenza is achieved. So through for this, we have this OFLU network. Through OFLU network, we are providing some standards and guidelines. And also we are updating our OHA international standards on manual, which provides harmonization in the avian influenza diagnosis. And also we organize global technical meetings, OFLU meetings and the regional meetings. Uh, we are in the process of revision of the terrestrial manual chapter, which will provide an, an updated information for the laboratories to follow uniform diagnostic methods. And we are also will be uh, re releasing the publication of the GIFTAD global strategy for HPI. Next slide, please. Could I please so, ask you, uh, Gunalan, to try to wrap up because we still have a few speakers. And... Yeah, okay, thank you. So this is the Aflu network. We already told in the previous speak about the contribution to the WHO vaccine composition meetings. Next slide, please. So we are for doing these poultry vaccinations for avian influenza. This is a project running successfully through Aflu network and the information is shared on the Webflu website for different stakeholders. Next slide, please. So we have the global strategy already launched as told by Dr. Mathur. Next slide, please. So we have also conducting regional meetings on HPI by different regions to understand what is happening at the regional level and regional coordination. Next slide, please. So we are also collaborating with the quadripartite partners and release statements so that we have a better understanding of the human animal interface. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you indeed very much, uh, Gunalan. Such, there is such a huge amount of work that is ongoing that I realize how difficult it is for all our organization to summarize it just in a, in a couple of minutes. But thank you indeed for presenting the work done by OHA, the work done in partnership and especially highlighting the, the role of OFLU in that. So now just to remind participants that they can ask their question in the Q&A module. Uh, I would invite also the, the speakers and panelists to try to, to
to respond in writing as we might be a bit short of time towards the end. So please uh, use the Q&A module. So now, considering the role of wildlife, as we have seen in the, in the in epidemiology of influenza viruses, I now would like to invite uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Cromi, who is uh, the coordinator of the task force on AI at, uh, uh, to, uh, at UNEP to indeed uh, present uh, the, um, the role of wild birds in the epidemiology of uh, avian influenza and the impact of disease on wild birds and other uh, species. So Dr. Cromi, you have the, the floor. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting uh, CMS to partake in, in this webinar. Uh, just let me know if you can't see those slides, it looks okay from my end. So um, yeah, I'm Ruth Cromie, I'm a scientific counsellor for wildlife health for the Convention on Migratory Species and I coordinate the CMS FAO co-convene scientific uh, task force on avian influenza and wild birds. So I want to focus quite quickly on the um, situation in uh, wildlife and then just uh, look at some of the responses, but it will be a, a hasty trip through. No, I won't be so hasty. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, so to reflect on this particular H5N1 virus, which emerged in 1996, really the wild bird involvement doesn't begin in a big way until 2005, where we saw this large outbreak at Lake Qinghai in China, possibly as a result of escape of um, wild birds which are being farmed, uh, getting into wildlife. And I think survivors from that initial outbreak plus... Um, birds which have been infected from a repeated spillover from poultry over the years and have maintained this um, virus in wild bird populations. A particular focus there is the um, activity of or the practice of grazing uh, domestic ducks, particularly in, in wild areas where you have very close interfaces then between wildlife and um, domestic stock. And I think that we had a, a rather stuttering virus in wild birds uh, for really sort of 20 or so years. Um, and really the, the change happened when we saw this emergence of clade 2344B, where suddenly we have um, essentially a kind of fitter virus, a virus that is better able to, to cope and be maintained within wild bird populations. And we saw then in the summer of 2021, um, certainly on, on my doorstep, the unusual cases in re very remote settings in um, Scotland, in uh, Great Skewers, and then this transatlantic spread of that virus into North America later that year. And I think what we see is a, essentially a fitter virus then also finding its way into novel settings. So there we see in the summer of 2022 in particular, this virus finding its way into colonial nesting birds, particularly uh, seabird breeding colonies, which then uh, we saw very high mortality. And then in the Americas, then we see uh, spread um, undoubtedly through wild birds from North America, through Central America and into South America. This slide just um, attempts to summarise, it's not completely up to date in terms of its spots, but it attempts to summarise some of the impacts there on, on different species, some of which are particularly threatened. Uh, but it gives also the scale of mortality and sometimes, you know, the proportion of populations that have been lost. And just to pick out one um, species there in particular, Peruvian pelicans, if that's 36% of that population lost, I think it's worth understanding that this uh, disease really is coming at a time of you know, um, multiple pressures which are creating this biodiversity crisis. And so in many ways, then it may affect the resilience of those populations, but importantly, these additional pressures then will um, affect the ability of these populations to bounce back uh, post-infection. Post so as um, Gunalan has al already mentioned, you know, we have this concerning spillover to mammals, particularly in those uh, South American uh, mammal situations with very high mortality then in elephant seals and South American sea lions. And then with this recent spread into Antarctica, and I think that we will see the consequences um, of what that spread looks like in Antarctica as we start emerging from that uh, Antarctic winter. So watch that space really. But the bottom line there is that we are dealing with really an unprecedented situation of um, a wide variety of taxa now being affected by this virus uh, with um, very large numbers of wild bird species and wild mammal species being affected. 
So in terms of resources, the um, CMS FAO um, Task Force on Avian in Influenza and Wildlife um, was first formed after that outbreak at Ling Ch Lake Qinghai in 2005. And its aim really is to ensure that the environmental considerations are not overlooked. You know, so sometimes we might see wildlife as some, somewhat of a, a poor relation in the One Health approach, but really this uh, task force was to, to represent the wildlife there, uh, to issue advice and uh, based on the best scientific knowledge, and really to provide that information and guidance for um, decision and policy makers. Um, and so it's, it's not a task force that comes with a big, big budget. So really what we have focused on is production of statements then that can provide key messages for um, uh, either parties to the conventional migratory species or other stakeholders with a situation update, but a real focus then on guidance on how to respond from the wildlife perspective and pointers to further information. And a lot of the guidance within um, that last statement are then picked up again in a substantive um, resolution that was adopted earlier this year at the CMS uh, COP14. And that really focuses then on planning and prevention. And I think very often um, there is a sort of sense of, well, it's in wildlife, how can we possibly plan and prepare for this? But there are multiple things that can be done. Um, and this um, resolution speaks to that. It reinforces that message of not responding inappropriately. It's not about killing wildlife. It's not about pouring disinfectants into natural settings and so on. It uh, talks of reducing risks then from um, light trade, livestock, from uh, grazing of domestic birds in natural settings and so on. And that importance of protected areas, which is reducing those interfaces, and also um, trying to reduce those other pressures that are on wildlife to, to allow some sort of um, bounce back, if, if we are able to, from, from this particular virus. So I will just finish up um, just by commenting on, I think this is a, a good example where um, really if we take one health approach, as you can see how important it is to be protecting your wildlife from livestock diseases. And so we have to focus really on how we ensure that future HPI viruses, other infectious agents are not spilling into wildlife, because I, I think it really illustrates uh, well that once something is within a wildlife setting, then that comes back then to, to bite us in terms of risks to poultry and also to human health. So I shall leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed, uh, Ruth, for, for describing the situation and describing actually the huge impact on a variety of wild birds, the, the spillover uh, to mammals. And uh, I, I, I sense also for highlighting, indeed, the, the importance not to overlook uh, environmental considerations. I think it's absolutely critical. And then your last slide on the movement uh, from uh, poultry to wild birds, but also vice versa. And this is, I would say, the, what kills us. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much indeed. And I think this concludes the, the presentation segment. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, and I would like to, to pass the, the floor to my colleague, uh, Julio Pinto, whom you all know, the animal health officer uh, working on One Health within our office. And uh, Julio, you have a, a couple of questions uh, you would like to ask the, uh, our speakers uh, today. So over to you, Julio. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. And thank you very much to, to our uh, speakers and, and colleagues from different organizations that have been sharing very good and updated information on, on the efforts and collaboration between agencies. But in this session, we would like just to go in into more additional details and, and practical information to share with our participants on the work of each organization. And I will start with our colleagues from WHO, Maria and, and Dr. Wenkin, if they can share some additional information on, on why it's, it's so relevant uh, today and uh, in, in, in compared to the past experience of avian influenza, because avian influenza has been circulating for, for some time, but what is new today from the human health uh, perspective and how we can improve uh, coordination between the human health sector, the animal health sector, the wildlife sector. In particular, what was mentioned by Dr. Wen Kin uh, at the at the local level, at the community level. What how we can make a difference at the at the local level. 
if you can address this initial is this initial question. Thank you. So thank you, Julio. I'll, and I'm going to start very briefly because, and I'll hand over to Wenjing on the technical aspects. But just to say, what's changed in terms of the context in which we operate? Uh, the world's very different than it was even five years ago, and I think the expectations for our organizations uh, could not be higher in terms of what we can do in a prevention on the prevention side of things. I mean, it makes the news when there's an outbreak and people have to respond, but what we collectively are trying to do is to prevent. Um, we've seen in all of the presentations this massive epizootic, this increasing spread, the number of species that are infected. And we at WHO, we never do anything alone. You know, we focus on public health, on human health. But if you're talking about these types of pathogens with epidemic and pandemic potential, like avian influenza is, we always work across multiple disciplines, across multiple sectors, and starting from the ground up, from the community up. Um, and that's a strength that we see. But I think the context in which we operate, where we are seeing an increasing number of spillover events, an increasing number of emerging pathogens, some of which we know they're re-emerging or new ones like these disease X, like COVID was. Um, but we're also operating with war and with displacement and with climate change and with all of these other crises in which pandemic threats are one of many things governments have to deal with. So I think what we do collectively and what has grown in strength over time is the reflection and the acknowledgement and working with governments to say human health, animal health, environmental health is in the context of po politics, it's in the context of economics, and these outbreaks outlive election cycles. So what we're trying to do is actually have this sustained investment over time and growing from strength to strength. So I think the context in which we operate not just from the technical side of things is changing and when she can comment on that is growing and the expectations placed on our organizations could not be higher. Over. So if I if I may, I would also like to add a couple more points to what Maria said. Um, the biggest difference is really the magnitude of the spread of every influenza viruses. And really, from public health perspective, what's really worrisome is the virus Z5N1 circulating in mammals. And it is still circulating, as we've seen uh, in the more the number of herds affected in US. Basically, this is a virus transmission uh, in mammal population. And this is uh, not happened in the past. And although the implication of, uh, of the risk to human health is yet to be decided, but this is something we would need to involve the, all the organizations involved here to work together because it's a mammal and animal and we also look at the human animal interface, potential of causing a pandemic, et cetera. The second point is that if we look at the human cases so far, Absolute majority of the human cases have exposure. Exposure to e either is occupational exposure, but if we, if we look at the Asian countries, most of them actually exposure to, to, to backyard poultry, backyard poultry. So this comes to the country on the countryside about the risk of communication, about increasing the awareness. And this would need joint efforts from the animal sector as well as public health sector there. Last point I want to make here is about control. How to control this type of situation? You know, one good example is a candidate vaccine virus that's potential to be developed into human vaccines. Some of them actually are from animals. So this basically is a good, good sign of those. And also about diagnostics, because the virus is, is evolving, as we know, the diagnostics need to be you know, to be updated frequently. So uh, actually, this is also being a joint activity between Oflo and the WHO Gisters for many, many years. And also, when we develop the standards, etc., it will be rolled out to all the countries, actually, globally. So through this, we will be able to engage not only the, 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 the at HQ level, but regional country level, and not only from public health, but also from animal sector as well in country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria and Dr. Wen Xing, from from this uh, for sharing this uh, information and and for your answer. Now I, I would like to move to Woha to Gunalan and and to ask Gunalan, Woha is a, is a setting standard organization for for animal health 
and responsible for all official notifications from from animals no? on, 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 on different uh, disease information. No? Mm -hmm. Then how, how WOHA is making sure that countries are uh, more transparent in the information that they share at the, at the global level, but also no interfering or not having uh, some issues related to trade, because uh, this is a, another issue that has been uh, coming out in, in different discussion to balance this uh, transparency versus uh, trade issues. I think uh, how how WOHA is working with countries to to continue to encourage them to to share timely information with WOHA to make sure that we have early warning and early detection of these outbreaks in in different animal species. Yeah, thanks, Julio. Yeah, WOHA as an as one of his mission uh, to ensure transparency of the animal health situation, including avian influenza, sets uh, international standards, notification procedures for avian influenza that has been adopted by all the members and encourages all the members to timely report uh, all avian influenza events happening in their territory to OHA through uh, World Animal Health Information System, WAKIS platform. This, through this platform, we share this information to the global scientific community for yearly warning and sharing of information so that uh, preparedness and uh, control and measures can be taken the sending things. Also, these OHA international standards are updated regular basis on based on uh, up-to-date scientific basis through our OI terrestrial code and manual chapters that provides basis for uh, yearly deduction by all the member countries. And also OHA, we also try to improve capacity of the member countries through our performance of veterinary services and also to improve the lab's capacity through our OE training programs so that they are well prepared to detect and report cases to OHA. So these standards set uh, is being accepted by the World Trade Organization as a sanitary code. This helps members to uh, report events to OHA without any barrier to trade. Over. Thank you, Gunalan, and thank you very much for for sharing this information about the work of WOHA. And, and now moving to Ruth and, and following your presentation, uh, there are a lot of interest to know what is happening in the, in the wildlife sector and, and how is the evolution of influenza virus and how these viruses are impacting uh, different animal species, in particular wild, wildlife. Uh, uh, can you share with us some some uh, concrete examples of uh, multi-sectorial collaboration in countries or regions or at the global level to to really respond in a multidisciplinary manner to to these outbreaks, in particular outbreaks that are affecting, like you you show in your slide on on sea mammals or other species in in, in some regions. Okay, I think um, I think it's fair to say that many countries have been um, caught off guard by you know the sudden spread of this virus, and certainly in a South American context, you know from colleagues there, um, I think the scale of those outbreaks um, and the nature of the you know large animals being involved and so on, I think really created a lot of problems because of course you need to get such different agencies working together. If um, but I see good examples um, happening in other parts of the world. World. Certainly in Australasia and New Zealand, it's almost as if they have got a, you know, they have a, a better heads up and that maybe this virus is not coming down in those flyways from the north, but maybe coming from the south, you know, from Antarctica. And they seem to be um, preparing well. I think they were ahead of the game. They've got good wildlife health infrastructures and frameworks set up there. And they have very um, advanced conservation programs. Countries like New Zealand have a lot of um, very rare bird species with very um, advanced uh, conservation programs for those. And um, perhaps even in the UK, uh, where, where I'm based, I can see that the environment sections of government have, have lent into this and are commissioning pieces of research to understand the impact of the disease in seabirds and so on. So I can see good practice in various places, but I think it's fair to say that very often um, some countries will feel that it is an agriculture problem and that they are leading on it. And it's been difficult to get that full engagement really from the environment sections of government. Thank you very much, Ruth. And, and finally, I would like to ask Madhur from FAO. And, 
and to listen a little bit more on on the one hell approach uh, madur and how fao is using the one hell approach to to tackle and to res to support countries in their response to to avian influenza outbreaks and how what are the links with the with food security and production because you mentioned in your slide that there is a connection with poultry production systems and the impact on production and and food security in particular in 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 developing countries uh, thank you madur if you can respond to that Thanks, Julio. So, um, you know, I think I think FAO's One Health efforts have at country level have focused on various dimensions, you know, as I mentioned, whether it's supporting surveillance, supporting joint response. And, you know, an example I can give of, of surveillance is uh, in Cambodia, you know, there's surveillance being done on the animal health side, but there's also uh, harmonized surveillance being done on the public health side. And, you know, that information is shared, the genetic data are exchanged to see um, what kind of cir circulation is happening on the poultry side, what kind of mutations might be happening when there might be spillovers. So there, there's a lot of that which happens during uh, surveillance. Um, uh, in terms of outbreak response also, uh, we saw a couple of years ago when there was uh, die-offs in, in uh, countries, um, Senegal, you know, where it was in a nature reserve uh, bordering poultry areas, you know, FAO supported multi-sectoral uh, response, bringing to, together experts from the wildlife sector, from um, the agriculture sector to, to uh, find solutions to deal with supporting that outbreak response, as, as Ruth mentions, you know, not destroying the biodiversity or the ecosystem or the, or the natural habitats of these birds. Um, and, and there are many more examples like that. Um, now the impacts on food security and production are, are indeed quite high. And often, you know, in, in, the, in the race to, <laughs> To, to prevent the next, next pandemic, we forget on about you know, the livelihood impacts. And uh, what we've really done through our risk assessments, uh, we try to highlight what these in, impacts would be. And we also try to communicate them, you know, not just on productivity, but also on how many people are engaged in that sector. You know, and it could be indirect impacts. You know, people could lose their jobs, the processing could stop, there could be food shocks, supply chains could be disrupted. And I think it's important to highlight them, all those aspects. And often, you know, technical people who are involved in these things are, are not the best place to do this. But in FAO, we've got a lot of expertise in economic analysis, impact analysis. So we work on that. Um, FAO's One Health program is really about sustainable production and consumption patterns. Yeah, so not just looking at production, but also looking at it from the entire, um, you know, supply chain side, but also looking at uh, a holistic view of where the threats might be coming from, because Yes, it might be the poultry sector impacted or it might be human health impacted, but the nature of hazards is such as Maria highlighted, there's climate change, there's conflict, there's peace and all that, those are drivers of risks and you can't look at them in isolation. Hunger is a driver of risk. Livelihood is a driver of risk. You know, People need to eat to survive and understanding those things, I think it, it really helps. And and we we try within FAO to grapple with those challenges, but I think I think we need to work more with our partners. And as I said, not just the quadripartite partners, but beyond those, you know, uh, UNICEF, UNDP, you know, there are so many NGOs out there who understand these things. So I think it's important to keep those things in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Madhur, and thank you all for 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 sharing this uh, insight and, and 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 ideas how to we can continue to work together just to finalize this session and then i i will give the floor to madur to close the, the event i would like just to ask uh, if our colleagues from who uh, unep and and woha in 30 seconds they can give some priority actions what what next? How we can move forward? How we can collaborate better? How we can uh, uh, improve our our 
our work at all levels, from the global up to the local or community level. If in 30 seconds you can give just your final final talks on on, on this on this discussion. Let's start I, with WHO. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because 30 seconds is very fast, and we'll, 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 I, I'm not known for my short answers. But just to say, I, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll speak at a very high level. I mean, I think the partnership, the commitment is there. Um, I think what we really need to to do to to be better at this from all different levels is focus on the incentives and disincentives for action, whatever that is, and really tackle the tough questions. Because I don't necessarily think it's technical. I really think the political, the financial, the like what we were just talking about, the livelihoods, the we don't want to save human health at the expense of reducing food supply. You know, so we have to find ways in which we can work together and really tackling those tough questions that are political and financial and incentives, disincentives, um, I think can help us. But I do think that's going to take a different type of effort from us. And we're committed to doing that. So that's what I would say would be some of the biggest hurdles that we face going forward in thinking of epidemic and pandemic threats. Thank you. So if I'm going to use this uh, 30 seconds, I would say that uh, we should build on what we have so far with uh, other partner agencies. It's a lot, but we need to look into new ways because the situation are very different. The challenges are very different. And uh, from my side, I really look forward to the joint uh, consultation matter who mentioned the new the new ways, whether there's something missing, you know, in the current situation, dairy cattle is new. How we are going to manage those? So these are the things as the next step, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. If I may. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the dynamics of the avian influenza infection and epidemiology has changed compared to previous years. So I think now as we all need to be prepared, not only the members, the international organization, different partners, private industries, how to tackle this new situation. The host range has changed. So we need to adopt our standards accordingly, how to enhance surveillance, not only focusing on poultry and wild birds, but we need to see the other side also. So I suppose that we need to enhance surveillance. We need to get prepared ourselves to face this new situation by updating our methodology and the uh, prevention and control methods. Thank you, Gunalan. And Ruth? <clears throat> I think when you go last, you should have had more time to come up with something very profound. So sorry if I will disappoint. But um, I, I think it's important, though, just to always understand that the environment is the setting for all health. It's what dictates all other health. So really, I suppose in wildlife health, we often say, you know, there are no prizes in prevention. But I suppose if our decisions are... Um, you know, preventative and working upstream, then I think that really helps to deliver health across all of all of sectors, you know, across the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of FAO and on behalf of Tanawat and Dominique Bourgeon uh, for, for, for your information, insight and, and, and presentation and sharing with all participants from all regions that are connected uh, this information with us and with them. And I would like just to give the floor to to provide some deliver some closing remarks and conclusion of this event to Madhur Dingra, that who has been uh, uh, from the beginning one of the one of the members of the team uh, that uh, is uh, was uh, discussing this webinar in, in internal in FAO. Thank you, Madhur. You have the floor. Thank you, Julio. Um, I think a lot has been said. I'd like to say a few words on behalf of who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, so I think we all agree that there is this big urgency to address the alarming spread of HPI. And, you know, we've, we've all agreed that we need to stay ahead of this. We need to talk about upstream prevention. We need to have a coordinated approach. But I think Maria summarized it that, you know, how do we, how do we take it from here down? the ground level. And I think, you know, the incentives, the disincentives, engaging the communities, understanding what makes prevention happen at the ground level is very important. Um, apart from that, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that uh, we need to identify co-benefits for each sector. It's very easy to say, you know, collaborative surveillance 
but why would one sector invest in collaborative surveillance if it's not bringing them actionable intelligence for their use or for anybody else's use you know so it has we have to identify the co benefits and i think avian influenza is a very good one health case because as we can see here all the four sectors are concerned yeah there's not one sector that is not worried about it the animal health sector is concerned for livelihoods, for food security, uh, you know, for trade, uh, wildlife sector is concerned. And I think this is an opportunity for us. The pandemic fund is a game changer. And I think we really need to leverage that and the global efforts on the pandemic accord to highlight that a One Health approach and identifying these co-benefits why should we do collaborative surveillance? Why should we do joint planning? Why should we do governance with one health approach? Why should legislations take into account one health aspects? I think these are things that we really need to think about and use avian influenza as a case study from global level to the national level to the local level to, to bring people together. Um, FAO's role is really in agri-food systems and our One Health program in agri-food systems uh, will now be expanded to develop a global framework, a framework for One Health in agri-food system transformation for global health and food security. So global health is a top priority for us. Uh, other than that, we are working on a sustainable livestock transformation framework for better nutrition, for better production, for better environment and a better life. Yeah, and as Ruth said, you know, environment, the agri-food systems are part of that environment, sustainable production, sustainable consumption and healthy agri-food systems, they contribute to the health of all. So thank you all and back to you, Julio. Thank you, thank you, Madhur. And we thanks again, all the speakers for your time, for your presentations, for you sharing all your information, et cetera. And, and also to all participants connected online. We have a lot of questions in the question and answer box. And thank you. Thank you for, for your participation. And we wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.